Hi, this is Tony Preckwinkle. Good evening. And I want to thank you for joining us in this conversation. I would like to thank also participant for co-hosting and making this event possible. As many of you know, I'm a former history teacher and movies like Judas and the Black Messiah are to me an important teaching tool. Every year we celebrate Black History Month and I'm honored to present this screening and discussion as part of that celebration. But I believe that every month is Black History Month because Black history is American history. Many people today are still not aware of the important contributions of the Black Panther Party, like their free breakfast programs and their free health clinics, programs that the government which tried to destroy them co-opted. Some people may not be aware that the Black Panthers believed in electoral politics, including my own Congressman, Representative Bobby Rush. Judas and the Black Messiah was a very troubling film to watch. I've been thinking obsessively about it all week, as my staff will tell you. I was a contemporary of Fred Hampton. I moved to Chicago as a first year student in 1965, and Fred Hampton was assassinated in 1969. Although we didn't travel in the same circles, I was very aware of the Black Panther Party. And I was also involved in progressive organizations in Chicago. In fact, the Red Squad, run by the Chicago Police Department, surveilled my church, First Unitarian Church, and two organizations that I belong to, the Chicago Peace Council, which was involved in anti-war activities, and Independent Voters of Illinois, a political organization that supported independent Democrats. The Chicago Police Department Subversive Activities Unit, known by the rest of us as the Red Squad, spied on the Black Panthers as well as dozens of other organizations. Apparently, in addition to the Black Panthers, Unitarians, Methodists, Quakers were all seen as a danger by the Chicago Police Department in the 1960s. Chicago was very different, very different 60 years ago. The Cook County Democratic Party was led by Mayor Richard J. Daley. Organizations like the Black Panthers and the ones that I belong to were fighting against a system that was openly racist and bigoted. Communities across the south and west sides of the city were devastated by redlining, hyper-policing, poverty, and a lack of access to healthcare. I vividly remember working at the time with the Independent Voters of Illinois, the IVI, to oust Ed Hanrahan, the state's attorney who was involved in the raid and assassination of Fred Hampton. The irony of campaigning for a Republican candidate for state's attorney speaks to how disturbing and pervasive the racism and corruption were at the time in Chicago and across the country. Across the city, the rainbow coalition that Hampton assembled was, was clamoring for transformational change. Today, of course, much has changed, but much is not. As Cook County Board President, as chair of the Cook County Democratic Party, I've fought for transformational change we sought more than 50 years ago. I've worked for a more inclusive political party to elect candidates who represent the communities we serve, to root out corruption in county government, to advance equity, to expand access to health care, and to transform our criminal justice system. So many of the ideas that President Nixon, J. Edgar Hoover, the Chicago Police Department, and Mayor Daley found so terrifying are not considered fringe today. Universal health care, universal basic income, the right to affordable housing. This pandemic has laid bare glaring inequities in our system and the urgent need for government to step in, step up, help those who are most in need. I've seen a lot of change in Chicago since I came here in 1965, but we're still far from where we need to be. But the change I've seen does give me hope. The hundreds of mutual aid organizations and efforts to help people struggling during the pandemic, the record number of women and people of color in local and federal government, the young people I've seen step up and get involved in politics and activism, those are just a few of my thoughts after watching this fascinating film. I'd like to turn our conversation now uh, to Denise Barreto, uh, who is our moderator. And I'd like to thank our panelists for joining us. They are Skyla Hearn, manager of archives for Cook County, um, Erica Griffin, public and community engagement manager, Chicago History Museum, Jamal Cole, founder, My Block, My Hood, My City, Anika McLaren, executive producer, Judas and the Black Messiah. Denise. 
All right, thank you, President Preckwinkle, and welcome everybody. I am so excited about tonight's panel and I hope that you are as well. What a powerful film, Judas and the Black Messiah. It's so provocative and really catalytic for a discussion this particular Black History Month in 2021. I'd like to open with a word from the film's executive producer, Anika McLaren. How did you come to this project and tell us why the story is more relevant today than ever? Well, the movie came to participant um, and to me actually in 2000, uh, 2019. And so it was brought to us by the producers of the film um, and Ryan Coogler and Warner Brothers. And they were really looking for a partner to support the financing of the movie and then uh, the social impact side. And so when we got the film in our hands, we just, I mean, it was just kind of an immediate love affair, the filmmaker Shaka King and the story itself, which quite honestly, uh, was was so uh, unusual and a refreshing project to to, to land in our hands. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting because it it felt relevant to us as an organization who, um, you know, believes in the power of storytelling, and you know, and and me personally, who as a as a black woman, you know, it's very infrequent that you know a project about the Black Panthers um, really manifests itself. And so, quite honestly, at 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 the moment that we came onto the movie, it, it felt you know immediate and important. But then that only kind of uh, played out the events of, of of 2020 and the the you know current movement for Black Lives really uh, started to accelerate at a rate quite honestly when we were still editing the film so it was one of those you know few special moments that happens in the movie business where you know you somehow uh, are just right in the you know the crosshairs of a political and socio-political cultural moment. And that's really what happened for us in this film. And, you know, if only we could say that we knew there would be the pandemic and there would be, you know, the um, you know, the the sort of bigger recognition of what's been happening to to black people and the murders of black people uh in 2020. We just, you know, it just kind of was um, an accident and we're just so fortunate and I'm personally fortunate that we were able to join to support this film and, and move the movement forward. Well, I appreciate that. And you know, I jumped the gun. I would love for you to tell us a little bit about participant media. Each of our panelists, as I call them back up, um, I would love for you to introduce, like I've done my homework and I know where you're all from, but I think our audience would be, um, would love to hear about what participant media is, like what's your goal there? Because I know you have a dual role, right? You're the executive producer of this film, but you have a role at participant media. Would you share that with us? Sure. So I'm based in Los Angeles and um, and I co-run the narrative film department at Participant, which is a, a film financing company that is dedicated to inspiring and creating social change with our documentary film, narrative film, TV, alternative content. And so uh, my role as the executive producer on this film is sort of part and parcel with my role guiding the slate of films at Participant. And um, yeah, so that's who I am. I've been in the movie business for almost 15, uh, sorry, 20 years. <laughs> um, so, uh, and this is, you know, a, a place that I've been working now for a couple of years. And, and in fact, this is one of the first films sort of under my remit and I'm just so pleased. Awesome, thank you so much. With, with uh, Anika's backdrop, um, I wanna hear from the rest of our panel, the significance of a film such as Judas and the Black Messiah. Um, and, and anyone can join in. And if you haven't spoken, make sure you introduce yourself in your role. Um, but the question is, what's the significance of this type of film in this moment in our history, particularly in Chicago? 
Who's going to be, who's going to unmute and be my first person? I'll, I'll try. How's that? Thank you. Um, you know, we're, we're still struggling in Chicago with tremendous inequality, not just in Chicago, but in, in Cook County. Um, and, and in this moment, I think um, that's particularly evident in the way the pandemic has wrecked havoc in, in our brown and black communities. I won't say that the majority white community has been spared. I would just point out that it's been devastating in black and brown communities. And of course, it, it isn't just the pandemic that uh, created this inequity. The pandemic just exposed the inequity. And I think the other thing about this moment and, and, and thinking about the film, you know, the kinds of things that the Panthers were doing, um, feeding kids breakfast, which we now do in our schools, um, free health clinics. We've got federally qualified health clinics all across the country based kind of on the, on the Panther model. Um, but we're at a point where I think we have to think about not just, um, not just addressing the, the symptoms, um, the, the, the real challenge is, is just profound inequity. And that's why we have to work on things like universal access to healthcare, uni a universal healthcare system, and uh, universal basic income. That, that, that the challenges we face then, uh, you know, kids not having enough to eat, hunger, um, people not having access to healthcare remain with us. And, you know, we're continuing to kind of do the same things. And we have to do something different. And what we have to do is universal health care, as I said, and universal basic income. We've got to address the inequity at its core and not just the symptoms of the inequity. Thank you, Madam President. Yes, absolutely. Um, that was the that was spot on, a spot on response. And, and I just have this to add. Um, you know, there's so much talk, so much rhetoric right now about people being unable to recognize this country, about people not believing like this cannot be us. We can't be this. But I, I would argue that because so many stories like the story of the Black Panther Party in Chicago, like many other stories of marginalized groups are not listed in this canon of what we know of as American history or Chicago history. Um, it looks like a surprise, but for individuals that have lived through these histories, that are raised on these histories, um, it is not. This is a, a continuance of a system, a set of policies, procedures to keep power in the hands of the few to the exclusion, to the detriment, to the hierarchical misranking of people of color. Um, and Chicago is certainly not spared from that. And the importance of the film right now is to fill in that gap to start to do the work to share and broaden the story of what this city is, how different people access it based on their vantage point, based on their social underpinnings, based on who they are, racially or otherwise. And this, this story helps to illuminate some of that, that there's so much that isn't shared. When we go through these issues, we're at the confluent impact of the pandemic, of civil and social unrest. We've just had a massive election that led to complete chaos in the Capitol riot. And this was a long time coming. Each successive generation, there are moments like these. And filling in those narratives so that people understand that background, they have that context is essential. And for me, this film did, did some of that work, absolutely. And tell us who you are, Erica Griffin, from the Chicago History Museum. We uh, have to see a mic drop, but still, we want to hear who you are. <laughs> Just jumped in as usual. I am Erica Griffin, the Public and Community Engagement Manager, newly so at the Chicago History Museum. Thank you for reminding me, Denise. <laughs> no problem. Anybody else want to tackle that? Why? Well, yeah, I would, I wouldn't mind jumping in a little bit um, on that. Um, <laughs> hello, everyone. I am Skyla Hearn. I am the inaugural manager of archives for Cook County government. Um, and so I'd like to speak to what this film signals, uh, which, has, which I think is in part, it's the importance of forcing a critical look at the current power structures with an understanding that these practices rooted in systemic racism and oppression did not begin within contemporary times. You know, that it is imperative um, to be conscientious of the world around you, the world around us, and to be abreast of the social and political state of affairs, as well as to dig deep into history uh, in order to understand how we as a society have arrived at this particular point at this juncture. 
Um, and then, you know, like, how do you do this? And of course, I'll go into this as our conversation uh, moves on, but I'm just going to say it really quickly right now. You know, we do this by utilizing the archives, which are primary source fact based materials that support truth the ability to rectify mistreatment, and it supports the deliverance of justice. And, you know, speaking to Chicago, so across the country, including here uh, in Chicago, people are calling for, for an end to injustices that plague our society, which includes accountability from law enforcement, an end to police brutality and murders, and economic equality. In addition, you know, being that the film's uh, central focus is on the contributions of Chairman Fred Hampton in the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party. It shows how Chicago people address the needs of the community to provide the resources residents are in need of. For example, you know, the, the film spotlights instances of social service programs developed in communities and ran by the Black Panther Party. The growth and development of homegrown social service programs that benefit local communities have been and remain continuous as long as there's a need and we as civic leaders accept the challenges and the responsibilities to take care of our communities. I had to bring that, you know, being a Chicago native, you know, <laughs> and, you know, just with all the, 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 the things, the negative things that are out there about Chicago and Chicagoans, you know, we, we step up, we take care of our own and you know to stop it there you know um, because I know that we're going to continue to get into this conversation but I felt compelled to share that <laughs> no that's great thank you so much and and you know bringing us to a Cook County government you know I was I'm the inaugural equity director and Skyla and I as I just mentioned were uh orientation buddies and and so that was one investment. And then the other investment was hiring our first archivist and building a team around her since last June. Um, President Preckwinkle, can you tell us the reasoning behind that investment and why it's important now more than ever? First of all, you know, I'm a history teacher, first and foremost. Once a teacher, always a teacher. And so, you know, primary sources are critical if you're going to uh, write history. And we in the county had never paid much attention uh, to our archives or preserving the history of the county in any way. And it seemed appropriate that we put somebody in charge of doing that, so it actually got done. Um, and I'm very grateful that Skyla agreed to, uh, to take on the challenge. Um, you know, it's hard to go forward if you don't understand the, the past and the present. Um, what, there's this expression, I think it's Swahili Sankofa, you know, you, you go forward while looking backwards. Um, so I think it's it's really critical that we, we pay attention to the history history period and history of our county in particular in our case. Um, but you know, African American history has always been the history of people of color in this country has always been marginalized, whether it's Native American or African American or Latinx. And it's important that we bring that history to the forefront because it is American history, as I said earlier in my remarks. Yeah, I, I am going to pause us because Jamal's back because, you know, that's the beauty of these events. We have some technical difficulties. And Jamal, we want to hear your thoughts um, and tell us who you are and what you're doing in Chicago today. But I'll remind you of the, the question. It was, what is the significance of this type of film in this moment in our history, particularly in Chicago? Jamal? Yeah, well, thank you guys for having me. Apologies for the technical difficulties. Um, I'm, I feel like I should have a master's degree in Zoom and, and you know, Hangouts and all this all this other stuff too. But um, again, my name is Jamal Cole. I'm the founder of My Block, My Hood, My City. Um, wow, um, the Black Panthers, man. Fred Hampton, you know, I'm a revolutionary, you know, just wanting to, to do that with my life. Like, come on, man, think about this. Like, I grew up, I grew up with uh, um, listening to Fred Hampton Stokely Carmichael, Mark. I knew I watched the movie Martin Luther. I watched the movie Malcolm X so many times. I thought Denzel Washington was Malcolm X. You know, what I mean, everybody was watching Aladdin, and I was watching Malcolm X. So just to be able to arouse the enthusiasm of people, um, to to be able to inspire hope in people, to be able to speak at the block level in front of the currency exchanges and the beauty supply stores. I, mean, I grew up wanting to do that. So, so uh, um, the significance of this movie to me was. Um, 
you know, Chicago is a stage. And if Fred Hampton started a, you know, a free lunch program and I run an after school program and I feel like um, I always take my students to see the, um, you know, the West Side Justice Center every February so they can learn from the Black Panthers. And could you imagine if Fred Hampton had an Instagram, man? Or could you imagine if he had like a, um, a Facebook page or something like that? Like he didn't have none of that and he was still able to do what he did at 21. So um, my name is Jamal, man. I, I run an organization that doesn't have programs, but we respond to whatever happens in society. So if there's a, a snowstorm, you know, we shovel snow. If there's a heat wave, we deliver fans, deliver water. Um, throughout this coronavirus pandemic, we've helped over 8,000 seniors in 12 different states with PPE, um, connecting them to primary health care physicians. Um, we raised a million dollars last year for all the businesses once the looting start, and we helped them out with, you know, graffiti removal, glass repair, painting control, whatever they need. So we are like the Red Cross for the hood, but we exist because, man, we're like we're inspired by people like Fred Hampton, man, and the West Side Justice Center and all the other, you know, social impact orgs in Chicago. So thanks for having me. You know what? I'm going to need you to put Red Cross for the hood on a T-shirt because I'm buying it. All right. Okay, <laughs> Thanks, Jamal. Now, yeah. I'm, I, I, so I had to make sure we got you in. I want to bring it back to Skyla. Welcome to Cook County. You have a tremendous background and reputation and the county is very lucky. I'm echoing what uh, the president said. Would you mind speaking to your vision for your department and how it relates to a film like Judas and the Black Messiah? Sure. Thank you, Denise. And, you know, again, you know, this is amazing to be on this panel um, with all of you. Uh, it's just fluttering heart here. But uh, and thank you for that question. So my vision uh, for the Cook County Historic Archives and Records Office uh, at Cook County uh, includes providing opportunities for the public to take a deep dive, um, as I mentioned before, into the history of the county, as well as to increase the historical record to reflect the residents of the county through implementing inclusive and equitable systems that preserve, document, and provide access to historically significant fact-based archival materials. We all know, especially those of us, and I, I prepared it a little bit. I'm going to read from my paper here because this is so important, but I'm, I'm going to start the sentence over. Um, we all know, especially those of us who are a part of the BIPOC LGBTQIA plus communities, we know that the mainstream historical record or records and narratives are not reflective of the voices of all people. We are standing at an intersection in history where we can effectively contribute to the change that we as a society so desperately need. This is where my work as an archivist, the manager of archives of Cook County comes into play by creating Cook County government archive, by creating, excuse me, a Cook County government archive center. Our mission and responsibility is to compile the history of Cook County government and to explain the role of the county played in the growth and the development of the region, the state, and the nation. And I just want to give some background information on what archives are for everyone out there. So the archives are both physical and digital spaces where people such as yourselves can visit with and engage in knowledge development with primary source materials that includes footage, letters, correspondence, reports, photographs, audiovisual materials to gather fact-based, again, information as evidence to develop papers, publications, art, and films such as Judas and the Black Messiah, as well as its pre predecessor film, The Murder of Fred Hampton, and so on. Archives are organizations dedicated to preserving the documentary heritage of a particular group, a city, a province, a state, business, university, community, a people. And that is what I am here to do. I am here to ensure that these voices are a part of what we are currently considering as history, as well as what will go down as history. Um, and ensuring that these voices, that there will be access to these materials so that people can understand what the contributions are, so, the, so that people can understand what our connections to one another are and how we impact and influence one another and build a better and more just society.
Wow, thank you so much. And I wanna I wanna bring in Erica because she does a similar thing. Um, you know, I just wanna point out, you know the, the Red Squad that um, President Preckwinkle re made reference to, the Chicago History Museum has a collection of those files from the Chicago Police Department surveillance unit. You know, the people that were, you know, following all the progressives. Um, so I wanna bring in Erica because I would love to hear your perspective on how your work in the Chicago History Museum connects the use of primary source materials that we saw in the film. Everybody who saw the film, it opened and closed, and we saw so many parts of the film that used actual footage of, of what was going on at that time. And that, I think, was such a, such a wonderful, rich contribution. Erica, would you um, tell us about that? Absolutely, I can, Denise. And you are right. You know, having those materials, the footage incorporated into the film was so moving and it anchors and makes real, even more real, the story that was being portrayed. This is the real footage. This is really him. He's actually talking, saying, doing these things that are in service to community. And you mentioned one um, one word there as you were as you were queuing up the question, and that's perspective. And I have to say this, that I'm bringing my own unique perspective to public and community engagement at the Chicago History Museum, much in the way that Jamal as a, as a young man was so very active and excited not only to um, engage in work that was going to uplift black community and, and watch those films that you know showcased other efforts, previous efforts, historic efforts to do that same work I was raised to be active for black community. I was raised to question what was not in the history books. I was raised to look beyond. My history teachers, President Preckwinkle, stopped calling on me after a while because I just kept asking about, what about this person? And okay, we have this story, Abraham Lincoln, but what about Frederick Douglass? Let's, let's fill in some of these gaps here. And um, that comes from my own family upbringing. Uh, my family's from a very rural part of Mississippi, sharecropping country, cotton country. And uh, my great grandfather was a campaigner for voters' rights, for community, um, excited to be in support. And his story has been passed down in our family again and again and again. And I just knew that he was somewhere in my history book. I kept flipping through the pages. I'd go to the library and he was not. The stories of the people down there, those people that worked the land, that lived off of the land, that were active for community and supporting Black people, they weren't in any textbook. And that we know is because there's been this singular story of America. It's that um, intrinsically upward sort of track, the, the sort of, not up from slavery, but up from slavery momentum, moving us from this time where things were unjust to the now, whenever that happens to be where things are supposed to be more equal and accessible and equitable for everyone. And we know that that simply is not the truth. And the stories that are often shared about the city of Chicago are often closed also. They are not inclusive of everyone. They are they don't give a full measure of what the city means to different people based on who you are, where you are, what you look like. And it is that perspective, that opening up of not only the floor, but the materials to help people make those connections to historiography um, that I bring to, to the table with engagement. So for me, um, Making these materials accessible through archivists like Skyla is important, but what I do is I make tangible connections to people, to the spaces in myriad different ways, whether it is through conversation, whether it's through performance, whether it's through a play, however it is that we have to do it, that is what we do. And at the root of all of this is this idea of historiography, understanding what's in these stories and why, and what's not and why. And to your point about CHM's holdings, um, the History Museum uh, has many things that um, don't always, have not always been accessible or visible or included in the programmatic efforts of the museum. And to me, if we are going to be in service to community, if we are going to amplify and bring these stories together in a line, then we must do that work. We have to take all of these materials, no matter how harmful, no matter how disparaging they might cast a light on the city, we have to make those available for people so that they build up that empathy 
for these spaces so that they have an understanding of civic literacy and also so that they are culturally competent. The, the state that the city is in at present did not happen overnight. We have a long precedent of, of closed minds, closed hearts, inequities, inequalities, barriers, literally and figuratively against people of color. And we must make that known. We make that known so that we can heal, so that we can reconcile. And as contemporary museum discourse continues to indicate um, this increased interest in museums being these sites for civic activism or restorative justice, centering people rather than the objects, the History Museum is in the business of doing that work. And I did want to share, I don't know how to get this to the people that are watching, but there is a, um, a set of materials. People will put it, you say it out loud, we'll put it in the chat. It's a link. So I'm going to do my best and I will put it in our link. That's what I will do. So one um, set of materials that speaks directly, not only to Fred Hampton, but um, what he was working through the historical precedent and the aftermath is within CHM's recently acquired um, uh, sometimes photography collection that has about 5 million different images that spans about 75 years of Chicago stories. And within that massive body of work are the most beautiful and poignant and heartbreaking and inspirational images that speak to the Black Panther Party, Chairman Fred, the West Side, um, and, and I encourage all to take a look. And what I do beyond putting and making these materials available again is to create those other ways to engage. It's about telling the story that's in a photo through whatever way we can. So I'll drop that. Um, yeah, in the drop, chat. That, drop that link in our chat and we'll make sure it gets out to the greater good of everyone. Thank you so much, Erica. This is, I, I haven't been on a panel where I have chills the whole time, but this is it. Um, <laughs> I want to turn to our community partner, Jamal, again. Um, Jamal, what are the through lines? You touched on it a little bit in your opening in answering, but what are the through lines to the work of the Black Panther Party that was highlighted in the film to your work today? And, and like I said, you touched on it, but I want to give you another opportunity to, have to share. Yeah, I just feel like, uh, um, you know, <clears throat> a lot of teenagers in Chicago, they have never you know, traveled outside the neighborhood, right? And so it's not their fault. It's just, there's not a lot of resources in the neighborhood. So if you ask a kid, you know, if there's 15 currency exchanges in your neighborhood and no bank, if you ask a kid, what's a job at a bank? They don't know, right? They've never been to a bank before. Um, you know, I feel like um, if, if you have to order your breakfast through bull bulletproof glass windows at the gas station every morning, you know, like, I want the Doritos. I mean, that's not, that's an injustice, right? That, but it's, it's like, it's regular because you, you're desensitized to it. Um, when the funeral homes are marketing Louis Vuitton caskets and Gucci caskets that light up at night, well, would you, oh, mama want to get buried in that casket. Like, what you supposed to say? Like, you know, um, when when um, there's more technology on the light poles than in the classrooms, right? Every light pole has a microphone at the top with the, like you're about to record a podcast, and we know that's shot spotter technology, right? It's like, but there ain't no laptops in the classroom. Um, German shepherds sniff kids when they, you know, come into the school. It's like those type of environments. That's not inspirational, man. Like, you can't be inspired when ain't no parents at this games at the school since so they work in two, three jobs. Like, you know, you can't be inspired when, when every billboard in the neighborhood says cheap divorces. Like you go to Burger King, you pull out the Burger King drive through it says $28 divorce or $6,000 tax advances. That's not inspirational, right? And so for me, it's all about, um, it's not regular, man. It's not regular and it's about talking about it. It's like, yo, just because you, because you, um, you have to speak up about injustices that even if there's even if they're hidden injustices, you got to speak about them. So um, I feel like what Fred Hampton did for me is I love seeing the movie and hearing how he memorized Malcolm X speeches. Right. Because when you grow up, you know, you're listening to, um, you know, Malcolm X, you're listening to, um, you know, you listen to Fred Hampton, you listen to Stokely Carmichael, and you memorize these speeches. because You want to you want to arouse enthusiasm in people. Right. You want to you want to express instead of try to impress. And then when you get to be an activist like I am, when I graduated college, I major in communications and I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get my first speech in Cook County Jail. I put on my suit, I had a, the tie, had, ain't nobody want to hear me speak. I was like, what's going on in here, man? I'm, I'm an activist, you know, what's going on? And uh, that's when I realized, man, it was, a, <laughs> it's more about listening, man. It's more about listening to what the community needs and then connecting them to what they need. But um, man, oh man, I love, 
I love the um, I love to take white paper information or complex information and break it down to somebody in the currency exchange line or in the Western Union line. I love it. And then conversely, I like talking about the how come, you know, according to the comptroller, there's, you know, people spend forty thousand dollars on the course of a lifetime at the currency exchange and they got they got the bulletproof glass windows up in the currency exchange. They're robbing me. You know, so it's like I love like just taking information and, and, and playing both sides with it. But the Fred Hampton, man, even the gear that he wore. It's a walking billboard, man. Like you, you can't get no grants. You better to create a brand takes seven years. So it's like uh, just even how they, how they, um, and then also their curriculum. Like we have a lot of volunteers. Forget that. You're not about to be volunteering for my block, my hood, my city. If you can't quote our mission, if you if you don't know the hidden gem restaurants or the artful intersections or the community roots in North Lawndale, we don't want you just coming into a community. You got to support these businesses when you come through. So I I love how he um he had a charter. I love how he had people doing push ups. And man, I just um, what a, what an inspiring person to me. That's, that's how I feel. Awesome. I'm gonna bring Anika back in for a second because Anika, how does it feel? And this was not this ain't scripted. Sorry, this is a a spontaneous question because you haven't been saying anything, and I want to bring you back in. How do you feel hearing that something that was brought to you that you brought to the screen, by the way, in record time, right? I, I understand how the process of filmmaking goes and for you to get the script in 2019 and us to already be seeing it, even as a pandemic is going on, I know what that took. And so I want to ask you, you know, how do you feel hearing what these folks, I mean, you said you're in LA, how do you feel hearing the response of these Chicagoans to your work? It's a little surreal <laughs> to be honest. Um, and I mean, it's um, it's it's really moving. I mean, you know, I think that um, there's, you know, being being in the pandemic, being you know, one step removed from the city in which this story took place, you know, it just and and hearing, I think, how much the movie is not only inspiring and how much Fred Hampton has been inspiring to all of you and Jamal particularly hearing you, it's just, um, it, it almost feels like a, a fantasy <laughs> in some way. Um, but I think what's really remarkable too is how there are elements of the film that you all can use in your own organizations are actually supporting the work that you're already doing, which is quite honestly something that um, we talk a lot about at Participant, right? It's not, you know, we're not the ones out there, you know, personally doing, you know, the work to make these changes in the community. So even the, the notion of the importance of the archival footage, for example, um, you know, which was quite something to discuss as we were in the post-production of the film. So, you know, that piece in particular, I was like, wow, right. Like I just hadn't, I hadn't thought about it in that, in that way. And, um, you know, even the recreations of, you know, O'Neill's Eyes on the Prize interviews, you know, all, all of those things, I think seeing that they're, they're part of this greater fabric um, is just, is just really affirming. And I think it's, you know, this movie in a lot of ways for us has become and is becoming, you know, a real benchmark in what in what work looks like in success. Um, and so I, I, I think, quite honestly, I, I, you know, I'm usually talking to, you know, a group of filmmakers or, you know, a group of fellow industry people. And so being part of you know your all your your work and just what you're doing in the community and hearing about you know policy and the 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 things you're fighting for it just makes me so happy that you know this film you can use this film as a tool so it's it's um it's surreal but in in really the best of ways I am so glad and know that some of us moonlight and do a lot of other things too. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to bring it back to the policymakers now, um, I, and I want to ask the audience. I hope you guys have t 
teed up some questions because we're in our last 20 minutes. I'm going to tee up the last question I have prepared right now. And I want to uh, make sure that we answer some of your questions that you might have for President Preckwinkle or Erica or, um, or Skyla. Um, I want to make sure that we we have the chance to answer your questions. So I'm gonna ask our last question right now, and hopefully some of the questions you have will end up in our chat and we can start addressing them. Um, everybody has touched on the pandemic in some way, shape or form throughout this conversation. And um, I, I wanna hear what are our visions for an equitable recovery, right? Let's be real, COVID-19 didn't surprise any of us who've been in this space at all, right? Like all it did was amplify those of us who have been working in the space. It, you know, we know that these things existed. It just gave us a chance because the whole world stopped uh, to see it. So, I mean, I, I want to start with Madam President. <laughs> What's your vision for an equitable recovery um, from COVID-19 um, for a more equitable future for our city and our county? Well, let me just remind, remind all of us of, of something we may know. So if you live in Englewood, your life expectancy is 60 years. And if you live on the near north side of Chicago, your life expectancy is 90 years. So that's the world we're in before the pandemic. And as I said, what we've seen is, is the pandemic has had a, has had a disproportionate impact on, on black and brown uh, communities. So when we, when we think about our response, uh, clearly government has to step in in a big time way. So um, I have been, talking to my folks in Congress and our, our lobbyists have as well in support of President Biden and Vice President Harris's $1.9 trillion plan uh, to address the pandemic. We, we need help at every level. We need support for vaccination. We need uh, support for personal protective equipment. We need um, more robust testing program. Uh, so basically everybody should be able to take tests at home so that they can properly respond uh, if they if they are not feeling well and then discover they have the, the COVID-19 uh, virus, they can they can stay home, they can quarantine themselves, whatever. Um, in the short term, I mean, what we've done right is put a lot of money into uh, developing the vaccine. Unfortunately, we didn't put enough effort into producing the vaccine. So that's an immediate challenge. Um, and we didn't have a distribution plan uh, right before um, at the end of January, uh, we were on a conference call with the folks who were part of, part of um, uh, President Biden's uh, vaccination program, and they said they'd hope to go into the office and um, kind of tweak the distribution plan, and then they discovered there wasn't one. So, you know, another one of these building the plane while you fly it situations. Um, so we, we did development of the vaccine, right? We didn't manage production well. We don't have a distribution plan, and, and of course, we haven't invested enough in te testing so that we can have simple at-home saliva tests rather than, you know, swabs, uh, the, you know, up your nose from, from healthcare workers. So um, we've, we've got a lot of immediate challenges around addressing the, 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 the pandemic. But, but our longer term challenge is the, is the healthcare disparities that, as I said, were illuminated by the pandemic, the, the, the incredible disparities in life expectancies um, that exist, not just in our county, but in our country. And as I said, I mean, the way in which we've got to address them over the long term is transformation and not just amelioration, not just, you know, band-aids. We've got to really substantively change things. And again, universal health care, um, universal basic income. We've got, we've got to do things, in the, we've got to work for things that are really going to make transformational change. And I, so I'm the history teacher, I'm going to say this again, you know, um, People in this country from 1619 on, when the first Africans were brought here as slaves, said that slavery was wrong and worked for abolition. And 250 years later, you know, slavery is abolished. And for, for decades, for centuries, women worked for suffrage and for equality. And we finally got, you know, an amendment to the Constitution in 1920, the year my mother was born. So, I mean, we have to understand that the things we want may not necessarily be achieved in our lifetime, but that doesn't mean we, we don't have to work for them. We have to do everything we can um, in our time on this earth uh, to advance the things that we believe in. And we hope that someone will pick up the torch when we're not here and um, move forward. But we have to make a long-term commitment to the change we want to see. Yes, thank you. Um, I want to I 
ask Jamal a question, um, just because you're the one out there doing a lot of this work. Yes, we're doing it at Cook County, but you're on the block, on the hood, throughout the city. Um, what do you need to do your work more effectively? How can government and philanthropy partner more effectively with you, with community organizations like yours, to make our communities more resilient? Because let's face it, y'all, um, you know how we say, oh, the 100-year flood that we now get every four years, or the 100-year pandemic, I, I don't believe this is going to be another 100 years. We need to start building this infrastructure. And I see people like Jamal, and I just want to know, what can, you know, what can we do at government and what can philanthropy do um, with your types of organizations? Well, it's, it all starts with people like Skyla just getting me involved in this, you know, people like Anika making films. Um, President Peckwinkle clearly, you know, like you inspire me. Everything you said right now, I just wrote down. And I'm going to steal and say later on, I'm like this, I'm, I'm taking this for myself. So I just, uh, I want to say thank you. Um, and, you know, Eric, I look forward to clicking with you too. I try to bring my daughter to the History Museum all the time. I want to go to the arcade. I'm like, no, let's go over here. But I'm a, I'll am talk to you about that. But uh, yeah, I was, um yesterday I was on 67th and Halstead and I was, um you know, I noticed the liquor store had been plowed, the snow had been plowed, but at the, at the Inglewood the free market where they give out free groceries and free things to the community, it wasn't plowed. So nobody could get the things they needed. And so I started, um, I brought a shovel crew over there, maybe 20 people. And you know, the media was there, ABC News, NBC. And um, and next thing you know, a big Mercedes Benz jumps out and guys with guns jump out and run at me. And um, and we, we, did, we did BDs. And we don't want you in our neighborhood if you don't, um, if you ain't check in. Why don't you check in with us? And my whole team runs, the news media, this is probably on camera, they saw it. The news media runs, they put the guns to my face. What, and it, I didn't think about it at this time, but I watched the Fred Hampton movie twice. Right, I, I seen the uh, Judas and the Black Messiah twice, and the way the way he was talking to those gang members calmly and still and collectively, like um, I didn't. Now I wasn't thinking this at the time. I was scared, but you know what I told them first? Hey, I hear you, I understand you, and they, and you know, you know what they were mad about? They were mad because they been passing out turkeys in the community forever, and no news media came and showed them doing it. We we, we walk people to school all the time. We we doing all this work. How come y'all don't? Should we love our community too? But um, but God blessed me with the um, with the composure and the and the um, and I apologize. I, you know, I apologize, man. And then we went from guns drawn, people running to actually talking to each other, exchanging information. What's going on? And so I just want to say, like, I, I'm inspired by the by that movie because he brought so many different cliques together, like people that didn't like each other. And what what do I need from from people? Just 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 um, just opportunities like this to spread what I'm doing to learn from people and to and to um and to just keep on inviting me keep on showing up and getting involved that's that's pretty much what I need I just want to share that story with y'all so. well guess what racial equity week is coming in September so we will be Good. talking to you likely um you know an audience member Donna asked Donna Neal Demir she said she thanked us by the way lots of folks have thanked us and you are welcome we are so delighted to be able to to have you and know that lots of people were turned away because we got filled up so fast. Uh, but Donna said, how can we, and her foundation looks like it's Zaka Foundation of America, be more active, more useful to our community? Um, she said, FYI, we already use our property in any way involving being a vaccination shop for folks. Um, or she said, we're ready to use our property. Our property. So. How can a foundation like hers be more active or useful in the community? And I think that could be directed at any, you know, any of you. Uh, but yes, a foundation person is inspired and in asking y'all. A funder is asking. So first of all, we welcome uh, partnerships with anybody and everybody. You know, I always say I believe in government, and government can do great things, but we can't do all the things that need to be done. So we need the support of community-based organizations and advocacy organizations uh, to help us. Um, so um, I think uh, Denise or Alex put in the chat uh, how to contact us. Uh, we'll make Denise the point person since she's the moderator. <laughs> um, if you're interested in, in lending a hand, we'll have somebody follow up with you. Um, so thank you for the offer, we're grateful. Thanks Donna for the extra homework today. Anybody else? Yeah, <laughs> just go to our website, formyblog.org. Come out, you know, get involved. We hang holiday lights up on King Drive for the for the holidays. We do youth-led tours of North Lawndale and Little Village. If you guys want to take a 
tour, an asset-based tour of the community led by youth, designed by youth. It's a great way to see the, the community. Hey, this is where Dr. King lived when he was in Chicago. This is the best hoagies in the city, right? If you want to see the community come out, and uh, we volunteer with block clubs, small social groups every week. So just learn more about our, what we do at formyblock.org and always you know, grab a hoodie because this is you know how we pay for a lot of stuff. That's how you can get them. Awesome. Them. I love merch. Love merch. Um, Erica, I'm going to, you know, you're at a place that probably likes partnerships with foundations. How, how can they help you? Um, like President Preckwinkle, we we are open to um, to partner with with as many people as possible. Um, for myself, when I'm determining, you know, the organizations that are going to work best for our needs, I like to make sure that our mission matches theirs, and they really are about support. And it is not a one time thing, but it is something that could be continuous, and that. What I'm trying to do is meaningful to them and vice versa, and that this thing is going to somehow be mutually beneficial. So uh, like everyone else, we welcome definitely um, any sort of support, chicagohistory.org. Um, and for public engagement, there's an education tab at the top. Um, please send us a message. I love it. And we're getting lots of thank yous, not a lot of questions. I think people really enjoy everything that everyone is saying. Um, does anyone have any before I, I'll we we're gonna we have a few more minutes. Um, anything, Skyla? Would you love to to add? I know, like maybe you have a an idea about something you might receive from a foundation. Well, there is something that I would like to add. Um, I was reading through uh, one of the questions that asked for specific information, and I wanted to tie it back to really impressing upon the importance of um, context, the importance of education, uh, the importance of you know uh, tightening the divide that exists because of a lack of education, because of a lack of understanding, because of a lack of context um, as it is related to you know um, historic. Uh, happenings. Um, and, you know, and I am, again, you know, honored to be in this space. And I look at, you know, Jamal and how he is, you know, um, the personification, I think, of like what we can look to and who we can look to as, you know, like our contemporary um, and revolutionary person within the community who is addressing the needs, you know, of our communities. But, you know, and I, and I think it's important to support that with the evidence of how, you know, folks like Jamal and, you know, uh, Marshall Hatch Jr. with the Ma'afa Redemption Project, you know, how these groups came to be. And a lot of that information, again, I'm going to go back to it and I always will, are in the archives. It, you know, and it's important to be able to draw on this historical context so that we understand, like within Judas and the Black Messiah, you know, there were a lot of things that were mentioned, but, you know, they also needed more information so that then people could make those connections to understanding, well, one, as I mentioned before, how Chicago shows up and shows out for its residents, how the county, you know, supports and provides for, you know, the residents, um, you know, things of that nature. And I just, I firmly believe that this divide is as great as it is, you know, due to a lack of education, um, you know, um, which of course offsets our understandings. And, you know, and, and something else just very quickly, I just want to tie into is, you know, with Erica, you know, being at the Chicago History Museum and, you know, having uh, the CHM now having, you know, this large collection of materials, you know, and, and also being in a position as an archivist and with Cook County Government um, Archive Center to connect to other similar collections that are throughout the city. Jamal mentioned the West side justice center there's a collection there as well as the harsh research uh collection out at whitson library on the illinois chapter black panther party so it's just really important to draw on these materials so that we can better understand uh the importance of you know um the historic uh relevance um, I, i'm going to oops, sorry, oh, Denise. sorry she got a question actually skylar got a question but go ahead erica you can say something quick and i'll give her i'll be quick I was just going to piggyback off of Skyla because we may have been reading the same question that was asking about where these places are. Um, are the homes still there? And 
And Skyla is exactly correct. So the materials are in these repositories, addresses, deeds, images. And part of what we do at Chicago History Museum is to activate these collections. So instead of just inviting people in to see what's there, pulling together the story. So we have virtual tour series of some of these places, North Lawndale, um, Bronzeville, all of these places where black activity and black action happened. Um, in addition to so many other stories about Chicago and, and that is um, central to our work continuous together. And so to that question, there are so many ways to engage institutions that do this work all the time, like CHM, like what Skyla is doing, just take a look, get engaged everyone. Yeah, you're right. You, she, you and her answered one of the questions. So there is one question um, for Anika. For, it's for Black screenwriters, filmmakers, etc. How did you select this script in particular? What made it stand out? And how did you convince investors or the studio to back, back and distribute the film? So I think uh, quickly the thing that stood out in the for this project, quite honestly, was the unique way in which uh, Fred Hampton's story was told. Um, so I think, you know, we get a lot of, you know, kind of straightforward, straightforward cradle to grave uh, biopics, as they say. And this one was really, you know, if Shaka were here, he would say, you know, it's like the departed, you know, there's a crime thriller aspect to it. And so it just reading the screenplay had an amazing energy to it. It was, you know, incredibly visceral. And I think quite honestly, the team who was bringing it to life was very attractive. So Shaka King is, you know, a very remarkable director. Um, and, you know, Charles King is an incredible producer. Ryan Coogler is an incredible producer and director. So it was a sort of alchemy of the screenplay and the creative team that really just, you know, made it, you know, a clear yes for us. And I think, you know, unlike some other films, it really didn't take too much to convince people on this one. Um, I think, you know, there were certain truths to it, you know, marketable truths. Um, and I think also, while it wasn't, you know, in the event, we weren't in the events of 2020, uh, it, there was something in the air that made people recognize the importance and the value of, of this film. Yeah, I think I appreciate that question a lot um, because people, you know, in these kind of forums, they want to have a chance and to understand what's what's behind bringing some of that to life. So thank you for that question. Um, someone asked, let me make sure I'm getting all of it. Well, Mary Lou, you answered her question about how to get a complete list of addresses associated with the Black Panthers. Um, but I really think it's um, important to read off something else she said, that she would like to spread the word about these places are so important to Chicago history. You know, fascinating that Fred Hampton's mom babysat for Emmett Till. I don't know if that's really true. Uh, but but um, she said was, oh, they're telling me yes, the archivists and the, they're saying that. And it says, was the house on St. Lawrence or somewhere else is now Chicago Landmark, and she's with Preservation Chicago. Thank you, Mary Lou, for your question and comment, and I hope we answered that. Um, I think we've gotten to all of them. There is There was one for President Preckwinkle, um, and it's about single payer HR 1384 in Congress. Who asks the president about a bill in this kind of, I mean, President Preckwinkle, you got that? So I don't know anything about this bill. I'm sorry, I can't respond to it. What I believe in is universal health care and, you know, how we get there. The specific legislation, you know, I can't tell you, but that's what I believe in. So Bradley, I hope that answers your question, man. Um, let's see, do we have any others? Um, I think we're at our, we've answered all the questions. Perla gave, had, had a comment. Um, let's see. Uh, nope, nope. I think we're good. Okay, so before we close out, we're right at time. Two things. One, um, Anika, I would love for you to share the film's website because it has lots of calls to action. And then we'll let President Preckwinkle um, close us out. Yes. Yeah, so um, if you'd like to learn more about the Judas and the Black Messiah uh, social impact work we're doing, go to www.liveforthepeople.com. 
Thank you so much. And President Preckwinkle, close us out. Well, first of all, thank you all. Uh, I particularly want to thank uh, Anika uh, for putting the, the film uh, before us. Um, and a reminder that you can find the film on HBO. Um, where it's, that's where I found it. <laughs> uh, HBO and thank participant and, and uh, Warner Brothers for, for bringing the film to us as well as the entire uh, creative team. I want to thank Denise for being our moderator. I want to thank uh, all of our panelists. We lost Jamal on the screen there, but Jamal Cole, uh, Anika McLaurin from Judas and the Black Messiah, of course, the, the creative team, um, Erica Griffin from the Chicago History Museum, and our own Skylar Hearn, uh, manager of archives for Cook County. Thank you all uh, for joining us. It's been a fascinating discussion. And I'm grateful to all who, who joined us to, uh, to hear the panel as well. Thanks. Good evening, everybody. Mm -hmm.